Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Fifteen years ago, I began a career in finance. And I became obsessed with hedge funds and people who manage them. They were called titans of finance, or some people called them even masters of universe. People like Stanley Druckenmiller, Paul Tudor Jones, were my heroes. And I loved the idea that with careful research and analysis, one could outsmart and outperform everyone on the market to make a profit, obviously. So I followed these guys on every conference, every hedge fund event in the world I could find to pick their brain and to figure out how they do what they do and how do they interpret the information that helps them make money more than other people. But then something changed and hedge funds started to massively underperform. It became obvious that the strategies implied by most hedge fund managers were based on something called information arbitrage. It is when you possess information which you could calculate internally, like revenue of a particular company, or information like future merger or acquisition or corporate event. And then you deploy capital on the market to capitalize on that. So these guys really had their time dominating the marketplace, but then something changed. Internet went mainstream. And with internet, what happened, it facilitated democratization of information. Information became available on demand. And this made information arbitrage much harder. This was spurred in part by the huge strides made in the interfaces and the user experience on the web. Like, think a couple of decades ago. People were accessing the internet using a thing called modem, and it's a small box that dials on your landline, and then the speed is not great, and then nobody can use the phone for a while. And now, my daughter doesn't even ask for an internet. She just asks for Wi-Fi. So interfaces completely simplified and made this information on the fingertips, available on the fingertips, literally. And the crazy thing that is now, years after I watched the democratization of information disrupt the hedge funds that I admired so much, I'm watching a new type of democratization developing. This time with the financial sector. And again, it's based on the technology. But the movement won't just make it easier to access information that's already is out there. It will open up a black box of information the public has never had access to before. And I'm talking about blockchain. So um, in the 18th century, Benjamin Franklin said, quoted, famous for quoted, that there are two things inevitable in this world, death and taxes. I argue that trust became an embedded component of our everyday life. But how do we quantify death? Well, insurance companies figure it out, right? Tax is also something that's already quantified. But how do we quantify trust? And what blockchain technology allows is exactly that. It allows trust quantification. And I'll be speaking about that. So let me ask you a question. Who, uh, please raise your hand if you have a bank account, available bank account working. It might sound awkward, but there are billions of people who don't have one. Now, try to remember how long did it take you to get one, to open one? Probably a couple hours. And I've got some foreign students here telling me that they waited weeks to get an account here. With blockchain, obviously, you get an account instantly once you install an application. Now, another question. Do you actually know 
what's happening with your money when they are in the bank. Yeah, no hands. So the truth is, nobody really knows what's, hap what's bank doing with your money right now. Because when you put money to the bank, it's not your money, it's the bank's money. And it's not like the bank has like, here's the stash that belongs to Bob, it's 500 pounds, and here's another one, 1,000, it's Alice's cash. No, the bank just aggregates all that capital and loans it out and invests. So literally, your account balance is a number on a centralized ledger, the bank's ledger. And when you make a transaction, a uh, bank instructs that ledger to move some of that money to a second person. So I was working for a hedge fund uh, during the 2008 financial crisis, and I saw firsthand what happened when financial institutions aren't held accountable for what they do behind the scenes with clients' money. And the aftermath of the crisis, I started researching uh, Bitcoin and its development. And I became convinced that by moving financial assets onto the blockchain, we could really use this technology in the public good in a really significant way. This process is called tokenization. An, assets, an asset on a blockchain becomes a digital asset. I'll be using that term quite through the rest of the talk. Unfortunately, we are like 10 years uh, since the global financial crisis and there are more financial storm clouds forming on the horizon. One of the most frightening is the deficit of the pension system. There are two main factors contributing to that. First, it's the demographics. There are more people leaving the labor force than exiting one, so it's natural economics law. But second, the low interest rate environment that global central banks are orchestrated may make it literally impossible for pension funds to make money. And these two factors are converging to create a ticking time bomb that with mathematical certainty will trigger at some point. And many, many people don't re realize it's happening. This is especially true of the United Kingdom. People are planning their retirement based on the trust that the pension system will be there and will continue to fund retirements in the way it's designed to even though that trust is looking more and more unjustified. So, tokenization. Blockchain, in a sense, is infrastructure that allows digital assets to travel around. In order to understand how blockchain allows to quantify trust, it's important to learn one of the most basic characteristics of the blockchain-based transactions. There is always a trail, there always a record of a transaction taking place. Ironically, many people have associated cryptocurrencies with money laundering or illicit drug dealing or buying things on the black market, but in a sense, it's the most transparent public ledger. And uh, when somebody sells a stolen watch to a pawn shop over blockchain, it's like putting a note, a sticker note on your window. Hey, I'm Bob, I sold this watch to a pawn shop of 500 whatever pounds on March 2nd, 2019. So the reality is that cryptocurrencies are way easier to trace than cash for, for the same reason. There is always a record. Of course, I'm simplifying this quite a bit and any blockchain enthusiast in the audience would argue with me right now that there are many other measurable characteristics of this technology, like hash power and difficulty. But for the sake of clarity and simplicity, it's best just to focus on transparency. So I want to talk about a few specific examples how blockchain enables us to quantify trust. First, there is a financial process called clearing. And it's basically a process of figuring out who has an asset and who has capital to pay for an asset. It may sound easy, but this process happens every day between institutions. And it's not actually an easy thing to figure out an ownership of an asset. Then there is settlement. Settlement is when the money has to reach from point A to point B. 
and somebody has to take account for that. Now, this is again the natural feature blockchain offers, although in the traditional world, it might take days, even weeks, for international wire transfers to take place. So we come to custody. Pretty much all assets are stored somewhere, and the owner has to pay for the storage of this asset. Now, digital assets are natively stored in software wallets on your laptop or smartphone. So in a sense, you could be your own custody. Combine all that, and blockchain completely disintermediates and disrupts the way our traditional financial system works today. At this point, some of you may be wondering how I expect all these transactions to start happening in the blockchain, etc. Of course, again, it comes back to the idea of tokenization. When we tokenize something, we are taking a traditional asset and represent it on a blockchain. Instead of holding a piece of paper or a title, you hold a digital token that actually represents the same asset. And when you transfer this token, it clears automatically, like instantaneously, because blockchain creates an authoritative record of this transaction. Tokenization will look slightly different for different sort of assets. Some assets, like equity in the company, will become blockchain native. Companies will start issue their stock directly as tokens. There was this ACO mania, which is now transforming into the next cycle with security tokens. But eventually, I think it will come to all business of all types. And fungible and non-fungible assets both will be tokenized. That brings me to another important point about tokenization. It deepens liquidity and makes markets more efficient. It does this by lowering transaction costs associated with the process of changing the owner of the asset. And every day, people spend billions of pounds on transaction costs. When these costs are reduced, people are more inclined and incentivized to make transactions. That makes markets more liquid reduces volatility, obviously, and leads to better price discovery. I have two interesting examples for you. Think about lithium and honey. What's common about these markets? Funny thing is, we use them every day. We use honey for breakfast, and lithium powers our mobile devices. What's more interesting is that these two markets are comparable in size. Uh, lithium market is around 3 billion, give or take. Honey market is around 7 billion. But there haven't been financial market for either of these things. Because why? Because our oligopolistic financial system was not motivated enough, was not interested enough to create these markets, as they are not big enough to generate commissions. No money, no honey, right? So suddenly, electric vehicles become a hot topic, and institutions are rushing to create a market around lithium. So this is the news in Financial Times that lithium is finally getting some derivative on it. But what's in store for honey? Um, it's actually a larger market, right? It's still on the sidelines. So the beauty of tokenization is that it allows to create any market almost instantly. It lowers the transaction costs. It lowers them that, that creating a new market is no longer cost prohibitive. And this is important because weather patterns are actually causing honey production to decline. This is uh, an article from mm, December of last year. There's definitely a shortage of honey coming. So I anticipate a number of consumers would be interested to trade this market and to hedge their risks, their exposure. So I want to end with one last final thought. Financial innovation is inevitably accelerating. We had pre-paper money dominate the society for almost 1,000 years. Then paper money was something we still used today, like for almost 300 years, we used paper money before credit cards were introduced. But as the move from credit cards happened to digital money, it took less than 50 years. 
And now we move further into 21st century. We are on the brink on a new monetary and financial breakthrough. And it will give us an opportunity to make finance work better for everyone. I'm totally thrilled to be part of this movement. And I hope after my talk, you are excited as I am. Thank you.